Thank you so much, React Trolley. I just want to uh, really quick say a huge thank you to Mike and Matt for bringing React Rally back. Before I started organizing RemixConf, I would say that React Rally is my favorite conference ever. I've been to many, many conferences. I love the vibe of this conference, and so I'm super glad that it's back. And I'm excited to talk with you all about the web's next transition. So we're going to talk about where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. A little less spiritually than that might sound. <laughs> but if you're into the spiritual stuff, I actually did bring a couple copies of this book with a special note inside. So if you're interested in the most important book, book in my life, uh, come talk to me later. All right, let's, let's actually, I know you were just up and talking and stuff, but I do this uh, in all my talks. So I'd like to invite everybody to please stand if you're physically able and would like to join us. If you don't join us, you'll be one of the few who doesn't. So I mean, peer pressure works. Put your arms out in front of you like this. Squat down and come back up. Yeah, this is called exercise. Yeah. We're going to do 12 of these together. I want you to count out loud with me. Ready? One, two, you're doing great. Three, four, does that feel good? Five, you can go really deep too. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You're doing awesome. Make sure that you don't lift up the heels. <laughs> uh, did we get to 12? OK, yo. stretch over your head as high as you can. And over to one side, and over to the other. Awesome, good, thank you, you can sit down. Uh, so uh, science says that our brains need blood flow to operate at peak efficiency, and moving your body helps your blood to flow. So that's why we do that. This talk is a journey through time as a web dev. It's a little forward looking and a bit of a game that we're gonna be playing today. It's not gonna be comprehensive, because I only have 25 minutes with you all, so I'll be hand-waving over some stuff. Also, I have written about this uh, in a blog post titled The uh, Web's Next Transition on Epic Web Dev. Uh, it takes 26 minutes to read, and I only have 25 minutes. So uh, <laughs> this is the faster version, I suppose. So uh, HTML 1.0 was never standardized, interestingly. Uh, we first got a standard in September of 95. That was 2.0. And then JavaScript came three months later, and then HTTP came after even that, uh, which is, you know, that actually felt like the wrong order to me, but apparently that's, that's how it all worked. Um, and then CSS came after that. So yeah, pretty interesting bit of history, but it was all over 25 years ago. In 95, I was about to turn seven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so this, is a, this has been around for a while. This is another little fact that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, XML HTTP request wasn't standardized until 2016, when all of us had already started using Fetch. Yeah, uh, that does say something about our interest, uh, industry, which is interesting. But from the very beginning, with the original HTML spec, we had anchor tags and forms. We had mechanisms for navigating between web pages, and we had uh, forms for mutating data on the server. So we've always been able to build web applications. And so over time, we've had different web architectures, multi-page apps. Um, this is actually when, when multi-page apps were a thing uh, that everybody was doing. We didn't call it multi-page apps because that's just the, it, building websites. I, I build websites. Um, it, we didn't talk about this. Uh, and then this thing that I call progressively enhanced multi-page apps that is distinct enough um, that I think it uh, warrants its own acronym. So I called a PEMPA. And then single page apps, where lots of us are operating at today, uh, spas. And that's, that's when multi-page apps got the name multi-page app, because we needed to distinguish between MPAs and spas. But I think that there is a transition that's happening. I call it the next transition. Um, and it also has an acronym that I'll share with you in a minute. So the game that we're going to play is called Follow the Code. We're going to look at um, the code responsible for these different layers or responsibilities um, in our apps. So persistence, uh, talking with the database, routing, taking a URL and uh, calling the right code for that. Data fetching, responsible for uh, the logic around what data to get for uh, what piece of the UI that you're rendering. The mutation, what to do when the user submits a form. Rendering logic, so what, based on the data that I have, what do I show? And then UI feedback, because no matter how fast you make your application, you can make it the fastest thing in the world, but you don't control network latency. So maybe turn on fast 3G network throttling all the time. Right, Ryan? OK, so uh, let's start with multi-page apps. 
Uh, UI feedback here is in gray because we don't actually write that code. Uh, with a multi-page app, the UI feedback is always going to be the browser. We'll take care of that. And in fact, you can never avoid this. No matter what your architecture is, the first time your user shows up on your site, the browser is going to show some sort of pending UI. In the multi-page app world, we had all of our code running on the server. And so um, the architectural uh, side effects of all of this involved, uh, or the user experience uh, part of this, involves this sort of flow. So the user would enter a URL, and then that would uh, hit our server. Our server had some routing logic to go from that URL to the right code. Data fetching would occur, interaction with the database, come back to the rendering piece that would generate the HTML, and send that back to the user in the browser. The browser would render the HTML. So that's how the user, and any time they clicked on a link, they would full page refresh and do this over again, every single uh, place that they went. And then if they wanted to submit a form, then they would um, enter their details, whatever, submit the form that would go to the, the back end that would be routed to the right data mutation code and uh, interact with persistence. And then it would send a redirect response. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but please, if you do this, send a redirect response so I don't have to see the confirm resubmission pop up that pops up. That's not just like a limitation of the web. That's just somebody did it wrong. And that's why we have to live like this. So you redirect. And then the bottom half of this graph is exactly like a document request, because that's exactly what it is. You say, go over here now. And then the browser says, great, I'll go over there now. And I'll do the same thing that I did to get the document in the first place. The really cool thing about this is that that was it, as far as the, the user interactions for your website. They're navigating between places, and they're submitting stuff. And so the mental model for this was really simple. That was the, the, uh, one of the really nice things about multi-page apps. And when people today are talking about how hard it is to build websites uh, compared to what they used to do, it's because of this simple mental model that was just so much more straightforward. There's no state you have to worry about. Your, your Redux store is the database. That was really nice. And of course, you didn't use Redux back then. <laughs> Uh, so also, there's only one way to do it, so that's why everybody uh, did it. But there were a couple of challenges with this approach. First of all, full page refresh. Every time you're navigating, every time you're submitting forms, you get a full page refresh. Imagine if uh, you're on X, <laughs> and you, you like a post, and it, it's doing a full page refresh. Uh, you probably would like fewer posts in that world. Uh, so that full page refresh was a bit of a problem for us. And then the lack of UI feedback control was also a problem. There, you could potentially put some JavaScript in, in the client and, and make a little spinner, but that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves. So we didn't really have that level of control. You just had a favicon spinner, and maybe a little bottom left corner where the browser would say, here's what I'm waiting for, or whatever. So, yeah, we were pretty limited on what we could do. But uh, as far as the developer experience went, that was actually quite nice. Because of these limitations, we went to progressively enhanced uh, multi-page apps, PEMPAs. And with this, we didn't throw away any of the code we had before. We kept all the same exact code. Because the idea behind progressive enhancement is you start with the foundation of a functional app. It should work. And then you add in a layer of an improved experience, an enhanced experience, based on the capabilities of the browser, like I can run JavaScript. And so all of the, the code that you're seeing here on the left side, that's the, the client code. That's all brand new. But on the right side, that is the code we had before, as well as code that's needed to um, um, satisfy the requirements of the client side code as well. So REST APIs and eventually GraphQL APIs and, and things of that nature. The, the bottom here, where it shows rendering, for client and rendering for server, that's a huge problem that we'll talk about in a second. So um, for PEMPAs, the document request actually looks just like a, an MPA. So don't bother looking at this too closely. The, the only difference is at the bottom here, we're loading JavaScript. Everything else is the same. So you, you land on the page, you get a server render of, your, of the stuff. In fact, back in those days, we wouldn't call it a server render. It was just a, that's just what it was. It, you, you, of course, you render it on the server. But we are starting to do a couple more interesting things. That's, that's part of the point of progressive enhancement is enhancing the experience, making it better. So we have a new capability now, and that is client-side navigation. So we don't have to do a full page refresh every time we click on a link. We can actually. Um, 
prevent default when the user clicks the link, and we can call some client-side routing code. We know where you're going to go. We have this client-side router. That router is going to talk to our data fetching code. It's going to go to the server. That's, that's a REST endpoint now that we're talking to, and that will get us some data. And then we uh, are able to render on the client. Uh, but this yellow rendering box is a problem uh, because that's running on the client. That's pretty interesting. Uh, we also have another new capability, and that's the inline mutation request. So now we have our, should we, should we go to LinkedIn now? So what do they call those? Oh, yeah, posts. You like a post on LinkedIn. Um, it's not doing a full page refresh. And so the uh, data mutation is going to say prevent default on that form submission. I will talk to the server via XHRs or uh, fetch request. And then um, that data will come back, and I can render the new stuff. And so the, another new capability thanks to progressive enhancement. Really, really nice for the user experience. And then uh, we also still have the redirect mutation request idea. So this would be I'm creating a new GitHub issue. And so I type in my thing. I submit the form. That's going to go to the data mutation code. It's going to talk to the server. It's going to come back. It's going to route me to the new uh, issue that I just created. That's going to go get all the data for that new issue if there are like, labels added or whatever. And then I can render that uh, new issue on that page. And all of this was in the service of a better user experience, to not trigger full page refreshes, to have better uh, focus capabilities for accessibility reasons, uh, to reduce the amount of uh, effort that the browser had to do in, as far as rendering the whole page every single time. It's a lot better this way. And so yeah, a lot of nice uh, user experience improvements. So no more refreshes, better UI feedback control. You could put a, a spinner right next to the button that you clicked on. That's awesome. But we had a couple of problems with this as well. So prevent default means, um, browser, I know that you have like a bunch of people working really hard on solving all of these problems. Forget that. I'm going to do my own thing, and we're probably not going to do as well. And uh, as my evidence of that, I submit to you so many web apps on <laughs> the web today. Uh, so also the amount of custom code was a, a, a challenge. Uh, because we had so much additional code that we had to, to write, and especially since now we're responsible for all the stuff the browser used to do. And I know that correlation doesn't apply causation, but I've noticed the more code I write, the more bugs I have. So um, this also was a bit of a problem. Um, code duplication is probably the biggest one. So the, those two yellow boxes I talked about, there's the rendering on the server and the rendering on the client. Those are often written in different languages, but they're supposed to produce the same thing. And so take GitHub, for example. You have their Ruby backend that has their Ruby templates. And then you have your JavaScript front end that has the, the templates in JavaScript. Often, that code cannot be shared reasonably. I, there are definitely some who tried to make something like that work, but it normally can't. And so even today, I should have checked yesterday, but I checked recently, and if you, uh, make a comment on a GitHub issue, and you uh, take a snapshot of the HTML that's generated for that comment. And then you refresh and compare your previous HTML with the server rendered HTML. It is different. It is slightly different. So just keeping those two things in sync was really, really tough, uh, or is still tough for many apps that are uh, deploying this architecture. Um, extremely tough. So tough that we uh, moved on to something else. Uh, code or organization is always a problem, especially when you're working with uh, two code bases you're trying to keep in sync, uh, or potentially you stick it in one, and uh, keeping all of that in sync can be a, a real challenge. Uh, and then the server-client interaction. Now you have REST endpoints that your client is hitting, and they need to change something, and, but, or you need more data. or So now we're making up a bunch of different endpoints. That, or, oh, let's just do a, a REST thing, and so now you're hitting like 30 endpoints to get all the data you need. And, uh, or you're getting too much data, and so now we invent GraphQL. Um, so yeah, there was a, a bit of a challenge with that. So for that reason, a lot of us moved on to the next thing, SPAs, single page apps. So the, the idea was, if code duplication is such a problem, how about we take all the code that we had on the server that was the, the foundation of a functional app, and we just delete all that stuff and rely wholly on the, the front end to do all of our rendering stuff. And then our back end, we'll just keep the rest stuff. And, uh, and not worry about that. So we'll give our users a loading spinner, and, and then our app can just be running on the client. So architecturally, this changes our document request a lot. So now the user enters a URL, and we get a static file back. Now that static file 
at the beginning, it was just like a, a body with a, a div that had an ID root. And that was it. And maybe a spinner in, in place or something. Later on, we started statically generating stuff. But for a lot of apps, you can't really statically generate the number of dynamic things that are in that app. Or, or you try to kind of fake it in some way so you have the dynamic stuff fade in <laughs> when the JavaScript shows up. I know what you're doing. It's, it's not as great. But um, once that shows up, now the browser is rendering the HTML, and it says, oh, I've got some JavaScript, and the JavaScript loads, and then the JavaScript can show its UI feedback, the, the custom stuff, and then we go into our routing stuff. And maybe at that point, we've code split because we care about performance. And so now we're making all these requests to go get some more JavaScript uh, based on the route that we're currently on. And now we can finally make our request to go, go get some data. We call this a waterfall. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Uh, and so this was a big, uh, big issue. And here's what's interesting. We still have the same capabilities of the PEMPA. So we have the client side navigation. This does not change architecturally and user experience wise. This looks exactly like our PEMPA did. And inline mutation requests, so favoriting a, a post, that is exactly the same as a PEMPA as well. And our redirect mutation requests, creating a, a GitHub issue, same as our PEMPA as well. So you're telling me that we made a, an architectural change to the web for no reason other than making this worse? Yeah, that's not why we did it. But that's what happened. We, we made this worse. For the user experience, this got worse. And everything else stayed the same. Um, my clicker doesn't want to work anymore. Whoops. Oh, spoiler alert. Sorry, I went down instead of, or, yeah, there we go. Uh, so the reason that we made this change, hopefully this works now, is we wanted to get rid of that code duplication. So by getting rid of the code duplication, we made the developer experience way, way better. So it's, it's kind of unfortunate. We went from an MPA to a PEMPA for the user experience, to make the user experience better. We went from a PEMPA to a SPA to make the developer experience better. We made the user experience worse, at least for that, that initial page load. Now, once you get the page loaded, all things are good. But that initial page load is really, really bad. So uh, a couple of the, the problems here. We still have most of the, the problems of PEMPAs. And then we also have the bundle size is bigger. The waterfalls that we just talked about are worse. Runtime performance is also worse, because we have so much JavaScript that we're parsing and evaluating on the client. And now we have to deal with state management. We had to do that a little bit with Pempas, too, actually. But uh, yeah, as my evidence to you at such the enormity of the problem of state management, I submit the 3,000 modules you will get on NPM if you search for state management. If there are a lot of people trying to solve a problem, maybe it's a really big problem. And um, I, I would say that for a lot of us, 30 to 50% of our time, our code, and our bugs are dedicated to application state management, unless you're using tools that are architected like this. So I'm ready for the next transition. I already showed you this. That was supposed to be an exciting thing. Like, are you excited? I'm excited. You're all supposed to Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's progressively enhanced single page apps. It's uh, PESPA. Sounds like Vespa. How many of you have seen Luca? Yeah, not nearly enough. Um, go watch Luca. It's great. Not as great as uh, across the Spider-Verse, but still good. Um, so progressively enhanced single page app, uh, PESPA. So this changes things a, a bit. But just to, to summarize it for you, the idea is we just use the, it, let's, let's go back in time to the PEMPA world. And we say, wow, this code duplication stinks. What if we just made it be the same code? And that's what a PESPA is. Just make the, the server rendering thing and the front end thing be the exact same. But it's more than just server rendering a React app, which people have been doing for years. It's the progressive enhancement piece that gives us what we wanted back uh, in the day with uh, multi-page apps. So let's talk about when you have the progressive enhancement piece, what this uh, PESPA architecture actually means. So first of all, the document request looks exactly like a PEMPA because it's all uh, rendering on the server, right? So um, this, we got back that nicer user experience for that initial page load. That's good. The client-side navigation, um, it, uh, the user clicks on a link. We have the router in the UI. That goes over the, that's going to fetch some data for that new route that we're going to. That, is, that code is largely shared between the UI and the back end. Um, that persistence will always stay on the server. Um, and then it'll come back and it'll render on the client. But that yellow rendering box is the same code as if it had been a full page refresh. 
And so we're not duplicating code. We're using the same code uh, for both of these. And so as far as your application code is concerned, it doesn't make a difference whether the user is doing full page refreshes between pages or they're navigating and getting prevent default because the architecture and the framework around that is emulating the browser. So for you, you can feel like you're building an MPA, but for the user, they feel like they're working with an SPA. So it's, it's, not, it's not one or the other, it's both. It's a PESPA. So uh, we have inline mutation requests, uh, very actually quite similar to uh, just client-side uh, navigations, except we start with that mutation. In fact, this actually looks a lot like the, um, a uh, mutation, a redirect mutation from an MPA, where we get that full page refresh, except we get to prevent default because we are progressively enhancing. Uh, and what's interesting is the inline mutation request, so this is when you're favoriting a, a tweet, um, that actually looks exactly the same as a redirect mutation request because, again, the framework allows us to feel like we're doing full page refreshes every time. And we, we're just working with the browser the way that the browser works. And then the framework around us, or the architecture, is emulating that browser behavior for us. And, and so that's, that's a pretty awesome win. And we get that simple mental model back that we wanted from the MPA days, like where it was so simple. But our users kept wanting more and more and more. So we had to do a lot of complicated things. Well, we can have the simple mental model, and we can um, eat it too, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that one too much. Not if you bring two cakes. Um, all right, so thank you, Mike. I knew you'd get that one. So uh, that was a Across the Spider-Verse reference. Um, so no full page refresh because we're preventing default. And then we get our UI feedback control as well. And we get browser emulation uh, that enables this for us. And so we're just, the idea is we're going to do exactly the same thing that the browser uh, does. And, uh, give the developers the feeling like they're just working uh, in an MPA, but then the users feel like it's, they're using a SPA. So we eliminate the code duplication by just using the same code on both sides. Uh, and then we reduce client-side JavaScript because we push everything over to the back end. I'm going to show you a code example of what that actually means. And then we have no waterfalls because we're server rendering when the user loads. And, and we can also prefetch in things because things rely so much on the URL. It's really awesome. And uh, no application state management at all. Um, because if you are building it in a progressively enhanced way, you can't use front-end client-side application state management. If you do, then it won't work without JavaScript, and therefore it is not progressive enhancement. So by focusing on progressive enhancement, you actually get naturally away from state management, which, again, is like 30 to 50% of your code time and bugs. So the cons are a little interesting because this is still new. It's kind of like dating somebody new and you don't know the things that are wrong with them and they don't know the things that are wrong with you. And then you find out and you forgive each other and love each other anyway because everybody's got problems with them. Don't look for the perfect person because they already found somebody better than you. Uh, so uh, one thing that people bring up is it requires servers. Uh, I'm sorry, but most of us who are building apps, unless you're building an in-browser game, you're going to have servers somewhere. And so like, it, this is, to me, I, I hear you that you're like, well, I can just generate my Webpack bundle and stick it up on S3, and then I don't have to worry about managing a server there. Yeah, but you've got APIs. You're, you are managing servers. Um, so yeah, I can, I can appreciate that. But yeah, I'm, this isn't a big concern to me personally. Uh, the server cost, definitely another concern that people bring up. Um, one of the things that my friend Ryan likes to say is, I don't think that HTML costs any more than JSON. And so like, you are still making API calls. You're talking to a server. If your server rendering that stuff, that really doesn't make too much of a difference. So the server cost to me was never a really strong argument either. Universal code is definitely uh, a problem for some people. They, we've been working in just like client-side stuff for a really long time. It's kind of hard to transition over to uh, something that runs both on the client and the server. Uh, not everything has to run on both the client and the server. Like, you, you're not server rendering a canvas, and that's fine. You just take the things that can run on the, the server and pre-render those so that when it shows up to the user, they're not seeing a bunch of things pop in place. That's, that's a positive thing. And uh, we'll definitely discover more problems, absolutely. Um, that's, uh, that's just the nature of, of things, and maybe there will be another transition. The AI transition, I don't know. Uh, so. My personal favorite implementation of the PESPA architecture is Remix. 
And I have been using Remix for years. Love it. Uh, a lot of frameworks are converging on these same ideas, which is really great validation. I want to show you a, a quick code example. I have one second. No, just kidding. Now I'm over time. Sorry. Um, we'll be really quick. So um, this is, a, in a single file in Remix, you will have your loader. This is responsible for loading data, and this only happens on the server. This is one of the things that helps us push more uh, JavaScript from the client to the server, is everything just moves over to the server. And then Remix is responsible for getting that data from the server into your UI, whether that be a server render or a client render. As far as you're concerned, it actually doesn't matter too much whether it's a server render or a client render. And that's one of the things that makes it so awesome. So we get that data into our UI. We render out those, um, uh, those projects. And then we can render a form, just a regular form. And when the, uh, the user submits that, we can determine what state the navigation is currently in, because the form is a navigation. And with that, we can uh, do some progressive enhancement. So we can show an inline pending state. So this is where the progressive enhancement comes in. Uh, it will work either way, but it's nice to have uh, something to show the user while they're creating something. While that happens, Remix is responsible for calling your action. And so again, we're pushing more stuff over to the server. You don't do your logic in, in the UI. Of course, you can have like UI logic for uh, doing validation and stuff. But the default is to just push more stuff over to uh, the server, which is better for everybody. Um, and so like, that means you can also use private keys. You don't have to worry about cores. You can uh, do all sorts of things uh, in this action. And one of those things we're doing is we're uh, checking for an error. And we return that error. And we get that into our action data, which we can then uh, display. So this is, I, I've been doing this for years. And it feels amazing. It's totally changed the way that I build web applications. And I'd like to invite you to join me, because it's awesome. Uh, stuff like this happens. Uh, that I just think is great. So Alex, uh, for the first time, decided to just pull up Lighthouse on their app. Uh, it's using AWS Lambda, DynamoDB, and CloudFront, and S3 for static assets. Authenticated page. So most expensive page and no caching except static assets, and got a performance of 100. This is probably desktop, for sure. But like, wouldn't it be nice to not even try and not even think about it, and then show up with a 100 Lighthouse score? I think that would be pretty cool. Um, without trying, that, yeah, let's do that. Sign me up. I, I'm in. So I've got a couple of things in, uh, on the slides here. My last slide has a link to the slide, so you can take a look at these later. Um, and if you want to see some more Remix in action, that first talk, bringing back progressive enhancement, uh, goes a little deeper into some of this stuff. And then that last link is an implementation of all of these architectures in a single repo with the same app, so you can compare uh, what those, these architectures look like. It's pretty interesting. So uh, last thing I want to say is I am currently working on teaching everything that you need to know to ship modern full stack web applications. It's called epicweb.dev. And I'd love for you to come check it out and uh, join me as a part of that. Um, I, after this conference, I'm going to start recording the workshops. And it's, so it's, we're, we're months away now. It's going to be sweet. Um, one last thing I want to say to you. You belong here. Thank you.